Most of the places where I speak, they don't have all of that, and I came up too early and realized it about two minutes into that earlier video. <laughs> I want to teach you a prayer that's just really simple, and I'd like us to pray it together if we could. It's just these three words. Come, Holy Spirit. Would you just hold out your hands, just palms up, and would you pray that prayer with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Let's say it again. Come, Holy Spirit. Because you are everything that we need. And even as I was praying with you yesterday and asking you to come, I sensed again that you have such great anticipation for this day, that you already know how this day was going to unfold, is going to unfold, and how it will fold at the end of the day for a new day. And we say, come Holy Spirit. There are people that will mark this day because of uniquely responding to what Jared and Emma just said, that you are called to be a missionary. And this day will be marked. There are people that are online, even right now, who feel pretty distant, but really close because, Holy Spirit, you're already working in their lives. There are people that will watch later, and they'll know that even though it was happening on this day, their day is the day they're watching. Because time is something you're so far beyond and yet so intricately engaged in. And so you know this time. And I want to pray over this congregation. This amazing teaching, Jesus, that you gave that, that when the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, the strengthener, the alongside one, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, when he comes, he will teach you all things. He will help you remember everything I've told you. And so, Holy Spirit, there are some here that need you to be a helper for what's going on in their lives. There are some who need you to be today, as you've expressed yourself, the comforter. because they need you to be that so significantly today. There are some that are coming and they need you to be healer and that's all within your name. That's all within who you are. There are some who need an advocate. There are some who need an intercessor and the word tells us that when we don't even know how to pray, that you yourself, Holy Spirit, intercede with groanings too deep for words that you express it in such a passionate, deep way that it goes beyond words, but that's who prays for us when we don't know how to pray and there are people here today who don't know how to articulate what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, they don't even know, but you, Holy Spirit, are the intercessor, and so would you do that for them today? And you're the strengthener. And there are some who need that strength. And maybe so intimately you need to be to someone the alongside one. We know that you come and you come in to fill us. But the sense of that picture that, that you're right there next to us, that, that we're never alone, that, that there's always someone. Our closest friend is not available. You are our best friend and you're right there alongside of us. And some of them are facing some things right now in this week that they need to be reminded that you're right there with them. And I pray that as Paul prayed and challenged us that we would keep in step with you, that we wouldn't run ahead, we wouldn't fall behind, but we'd enjoy and experience deeply what it is to have you alongside of us. And so, Holy Spirit, teach us today. And that verse finishes by saying, and he will help you remember everything that I've told you, and what an incredible, incredible prayer that that is. We thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Hi, I'm Dennis Jackson. I grew up in Battle Creek. I lived on South Mingus Road in this huge brick house that was built in 1836. I never attended church except one time a year and it wasn't Easter and it wasn't Christmas. Every year we would ask my mom, what do you want for, for Mother's Day? And she'd say, I'd like to go to church. 
We never came to this church. We went to a little Methodist church out in the middle of nowhere, and we promised every year we're going to start going to church. One year, we actually went the next Sunday. That was it for the next year, you know? It was just Mother's Day. But in 1973, somebody invited me to come to this church, and I'll tell you why. I was dating a girl that I just had found out was the preacher's daughter. That was scary. My parents only let me date two times a week, but they didn't count church. I went Sunday morning, Sunday night. I was a show-up kind of guy. And for the first time in my life, I heard the gospel. I remember there was a Sunday school teacher named Dale Aldrich. Some of you would know him. He passed. But, but he, one day, he was pretty boring, except to me, because all of it was new to me. He pulled out this little booklet, and he said, before I teach today, I just wanted to read this little booklet to you. And he opened it up, and it said, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I had never heard that in my life. I believed in God, and I was quite sure he was very angry with me and was going to snuff me out any time, and now I'm kind of playing this game about church even more, but I didn't know he loved me. And about four months into that, hearing the gospel and hearing people pray and watching people and people loving me and caring for me, there was a Sunday night service when somebody gave the invitation that if you'd like to receive Christ, I was sitting with that girl that I was dating and a good friend of hers, and there was an altar call. I didn't know what that was before I went started going to church, but but they both went forward. And I was hanging on, we had pews back then, remember pews? I was hanging on for life on that pew, and I wanted to go, and I didn't want to go, and I wanted to go, and I didn't want to go, and the pastor up front was saying, every eye closed, no one looking around. But there was a guy named Gary Bennett who worked for Youth for Christ at that time. And he saw me. And he came over to me. And he said, Dennis, would you like to go forward? And I did. And it changed my life forever. I've often thought back to that moment. What if Gary would have just been somebody who looked and said, there's another troubled teen, you know, like, What if he would have looked and said, you know what, I'm going to try to catch him after the service and chat with him because it looks like he's in trouble with something. What if he would have just said, I'm going to just pray right now. What if he would have kept his eyes closed because that's what the pastor said to do. Every eye closed, no one looking around, you know. But no, Gary saw me. And he asked me a question and took me forward and led me to Christ. And this church discipled me we went through a revival soon after that, and, and, and they had prayer meetings. The pastor said, why don't we just gather? For seven weeks, there was no preaching in the church because God was moving so powerfully, and, and they just said, well, there's a prayer meeting. We'll just do it every morning at 6 a.m., and I just thought everybody would show up. There were about 50, 60, 75 people in those first days, and there was a guy that lived about a mile from me. I didn't have a driver's license. I would walk to his house because I was so eager to get here. That went on for three years. I remember after I got my license and stuff, later on, Pete, the guy that took me every day, said, I was so done with that prayer meeting, but you kept showing up at my door. (laughs) (laughs) And God used this church to just transform my life. And then there was a day, is Pastor Zul here? I just need to, where are you at? Way back there. They used to line us up when you graduated from high school, across the front, the seniors, you know, and Pastor Zul would give everybody a book and just shake their hand. But when he got to me, he grabbed my hand with both hands, and he said, Dennis, be a pastor. God had been stirring my heart, but I was really in doubt, and I was too young to know what, you know, in my faith to know God speaking to me. I thought he was, but I'm like, I don't know. That seems crazy. Like, I, I'm just brand new in this thing. I'm, I don't even know what I'm talking about, and that sealed it in my life. I want you to know, Pastor, I have doubted so many things in my life over these years, but I've never doubted that call because he called it out of my life. He did for me what... It's just these simple letters, I see in you. Listen, I've run into a whole bunch of people that come up to me crying, elderly people who will say, you know, I remember when God called me to be a missionary. And I'm sitting there going, I can't wait to hear the story. I can't wait to hear the story. Tears begin to flow down their faces. 
And then they said this, but I never went. And here's what I believe. God spoke to them. People around them said, oh, she's going to be a missionary. Oh, man, he's going to be a missionary. They show up for all the missionary services, asking questions. They're studying maps and things. They're going to be a missionary, but they never said it to them. They only thought it and said it to each other. And the enemy comes and steals to kill and destroy and stole that away. Thank you. I have the privilege of giving leadership to global partners. We're in 99 countries around the world. We have missionaries in about 30 because the national churches don't need missionaries in several places. They need them where these guys are going. I mean, so badly, you wouldn't believe how bad it's needed. There are so few missionaries in those areas. It was a big deal when I lived here if we could go to Kalamazoo. (laughs) I went to Grand Rapids one day when I was a kid, you know? And I've been in 104 countries now. I just pinch myself every day that the God of the universe was working in a kid who had no background, no understanding, no faith. And I believe, just as Jared and Emma just said a few moments ago, that God's calling some people today, and if he calls you, say yes, say yes, say yes. So Lord, would you seal whatever you're speaking now? I'm not to the message yet, but I want to take a picture of this because my wife couldn't be here today. We've been traveling crazy and she just needed to stay home and rest a little bit, but I don't want to forget. And she always says, well, who is there? So I'm taking pictures and here's how it goes. Okay, so like I need you to like kind of cheer or raise your hands or do something, but let me just say how it goes. You kind of start weak and it's weak and then it gets stronger, stronger, stronger. And then that area just, so don't do that. I mean, get into it right away, okay? This is a really responsive congregation. Let's go. One, two, three. I wasn't talking to your section yet. Okay, here we go. This section right here. Here we go. One, two, three. Now you didn't participate this time. Got to turn on the wide again. Here we go. One, two, three. Yeah, I think you beat him. Come on, right over here. Fewer voices. Let's make it work. Wait. I have to say one, two, three. You're, you're eager, though. I appreciate that. One, two, three. I think by numbers you got them. I can, uh, get your baby back, yeah. I don't want to forget this time. We're in Acts chapter 8, and I want to just give you a little bit of the background on that. Um, I'm just so excited to be able to share the word of God, so it's so powerful. I love the background of this chapter because it's about Philip. Philip is a deacon. He's one of the guys who's raised up to take care of widows, right? Because they just can't keep up with all of the needs they have and keep on preaching the gospel. And so in 6 and 7, these guys are chosen. There's only two qualifications. Filled with wisdom, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's a pretty good leadership qualification, right? Filled with wisdom, filled with the Holy Spirit. And he's a marketplace guy. He's a layman. He's not a pastor. He's not a trained preacher. He's not one of the apostles. He's, he's just a guy who says, I'm faithful, and they select him and stuff. Then there's this great persecution. You remember Stephen, one of the other deacons, is killed. He's taken out. He's martyred. They stone him to death. And, and so the church is distributed by persecution. Do you know that one of the greatest resources in the spread of the gospel is persecution that people go out and share and people stand up and go I'll go to the hard places I'll go to the difficult place and and it actually produces pushing the church out because we get comfortable we like staying where we are I kind of like my life and all of a sudden there's pressure and we have stories right around the world right now one of our mission one of our pastors local pastors in a country that's it's a very difficult country I'm not going to mention the name of it was just murdered for his faith We've had churches burned in just the last few months. It doesn't make the news, but it's reality all the time. And the persecution sends these guys out because that's what missionaries do. That's what Christ followers do. And so look at the passage here with me. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Philip's had this great revival, by the way. 
Samaria is just transformed. And you remember that the gospel said, start in Jerusalem and Judea. They were doing that and Samaria, boo hiss. Remember, Samaria is not a likable place, a likable people. They hate the Jews. The Jews hate them. Christians go, we'll break the barrier. And so Philip goes out there, then the ends of the earth. And so he's out there and Philip starts going there, sharing the gospel and people are responding. People come up to him and say, I've got a sister that's got a lame leg. And he goes, I've never done this healing thing before. In the name of Jesus, be healed. Things happen. He's actually doing miracles. He's preaching the gospel. He's a lay person. We all have a message to share. And so he's out there doing it. It's so significant. They hear about it in Jerusalem, and they send Peter and John like, hey, let's make sure this is legit. It's a layman doing this. Thank God it's a layman doing it because it doesn't get messed up. And then at the peak of this amazing move of God, it says, now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south of the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. He sent him to the middle of nowhere. So what does he do? He starts out, and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of the treasury of an entire country. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in a chariot, reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet, and the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Love this. Then Philip ran up. Hey, this guy's probably got a lot of soldiers around him too. Philip doesn't care. He runs up to him, and the man's reading Isaiah, and he says, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invites Philip to come up and sit with him in the chariot. This is a passage of scripture that they're reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as the lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage and tells him all of the scriptures and the good news about Jesus. I don't know how long this ride was going, but he explained it enough that the next thing that happens, it says, as they travel along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. I want to travel just once this way. You know, like, I'm in jets a lot. I'd love to just, oh, I'm already here. Um, it took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at his Otis and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. I love this story. It's a layman. He's new to the faith. He had become a leader because he was filled with wisdom and filled with the Holy Spirit. And when the gospel causes persecution, he goes. And when he goes, he shares his faith. We can do that every day. I wanna ask you five questions. The first one is this, are we listening for Holy Spirit? Are we listening for Holy Spirit? We are so busy in our lives, Holy Spirit speaks. Sometimes when we least expect it, Philip, you know, is in the middle of something happening so great, and Holy Spirit can get through to him and say, I want you to go to a desert road. I'm in the middle of a city of great things. Go to the desert road. You know why I don't think we hear the Holy Spirit? This. We're so distracted. Some of you don't even know I'm holding it up because you're looking at it right now. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how... You can go anywhere and everybody's just looking at their phone, looking at their phone, looking at their phone. I, I've seen people, couples, out in some what looks like a, you know, either a honeymoon spot or a spot where they're going maybe through their 25th anniversary, both looking at the phone. How romantic is that? I was in Brazil one day and I had a not great hotel, but I realized one day I had a balcony and I'm like, cool. I went out on the balcony, it was kind of dodgy looking, but I looked down, there's a coffee shop down there, 21 people in it. 20 of them looking at their phones. My heart broke. I just thought to myself, doesn't that other person have a phone? 
Maybe we could take an offering today and give them a phone. You know, I mean, it's just crazy. We're so attached to this that we're missing everything around us. And now everybody's got earbuds in, so we can't talk. It's an interruption. And we're telling people sometimes, don't talk to me. I'm, I'm listening to something very important, you know. I, you're not important. Man, take them out. Put the phone down. Watch what God, Holy Spirit, might be doing all around you. Because he speaks, but my question is, are we listening? Are we paying any attention at all? And I've just decided I'm going to work really hard at just being a better listener, you know? I'm going to put the ears on and just say, okay, who does God want me to speak to today? Because you know what? He's speaking. He's moving. And who do you think he's going to use to share the faith if he doesn't use us? Are you listening? Are you paying attention? Because the Holy Spirit speaks, are we listening, is all that really matters. We ought to be anticipating that God's moving among us. We ought to be saying, God, what do you want to do? I was just with a friend, and his wife was teaching English as a second language to some students in the place where they were living, and there was a Japanese man, and he picked out that they were probably Christians, and he just announced to the class, announced to the leaders, I'm an atheist. You know what my friend said to him? Great, do you want to study the Bible? And the guy said, yeah, I'd like to study the Bible. Like, my first thought is atheist. Okay, how am I going to figure this out? How do I talk to him? What kind of plan could I ever have to talk to him? I probably need to find out how he became, you know. No, he just said, would you like to study the Bible? Like, I studied the Bible. Nine years later, I'm with this guy, and he gets a text. Steve, my friend, has a wife who has terminal cancer. They've done everything they can do. And this guy knows about it, writes, and says, I've been reading over Psalm 95 and just thinking about your wife and thinking about how great this verse is for your wife as an encouragement. Not sure he's yet come to faith, but he got him in the Word, and the Word transforms lives. Are we listening for Holy Spirit? Here's a second question. Are we willing to cross barriers? There's so many differences between these two people. Ethiopian eunuch and, and, and Philip. Backgrounds are different. Age is probably different. Language was probably different. Ethnicity is. He's black African. He's Jewish. There, there's all kinds of customs and cultural issues. One of the things that I have struggled with around the world is trying to greet people because you don't know what the customs are. I was in Russia for the first time, and I'm a handshaker. I'm really a hugger, but you got to be careful on that one. You just test that out, and I'm shoving my hand out there, shaking hands. I'm shaking hands with the women, and the missionary pulls me aside and says, don't shake hands with women. I said, they, well, they shook hands with me. Yeah, because you're a stupid American and don't know the custom. We don't shake hands with women here. It's not proper. You don't touch like that. I get other places. I, I've been to Japan, and they bow, you know, like, but how many times do you bow? Like, I'm, I'm looking up, and it's kind of awkward when you're looking to see when you're bowing, you know, like, are they bowing still? And if they bowed, and if I bowed, they maybe think they, I don't know what you do with that. Where we lived in Budapest, Hungary for three years, and you guys were on our team then, for three years, they do that thing where they do the cheek kiss, but they don't really kiss. It's an air kiss, but you, you lock cheeks and you go both sides, right? But you only do it with people you know well, family members. Grandmas do it with all the kids and stuff like that. But, but couples do it. I mean, it's just so, so I got this landlord who's just raving extrovert, and, and it's like, I know one of these times I'm going to come home, and she's going to do that kiss thing, and it matters which way you go, Right? So I'm studying, right? I'm studying every person I see. I'm studying every person I see. The young couple comes together and they do it and they go left and then right. Go left and go right. I'm watching even little kids go left, go right, go left, go right. I come home one day, Maria is her name, and I'm just thinking, you know what? Um, oh, here she comes. I try to run up my stairs, but she caught me. She comes down her stairs. She's coming at me like this, and I'm going, go left, go left, go left. I went left. She went right. <laughs> right on the lips. She's laughing. I had nightmares for weeks, you know? <laughs> but, but there's cultural differences that we have. Are you willing to cross some of those barriers? What about socioeconomic barriers? Here's the reality of what Jared and Emma just shared with us. Four in ten persons in the world have no access to the gospel in their community. That means there's not one believer in their community. We have some people that are in Eastern Europe right now, just moved into a city about four years ago. A city of 52,000. What's Battle Creek these days? What's the population? What? 
Battle Creek is 100,000? No, it's not. Anyway, say it is. Okay. You just learned something at church. Our city's 100,000. Um, so 52,000 people in that community. When our two missionary adults moved into the community, they have kids that are all grown. There are now two Christ followers with 52,000 people around them. And they're sharing the gospel. And they're studying the word of God with people. And they're just praying that somehow all the barriers in that country would break, break down. There are no other believers there. Well, we have places four and 10. Can you do that with me? Can you hold up four fingers? Four and 10. Four and 10 live in a place where there's no access to the gospel. That's where these guys are going. To run into a Christ follower in some of these places is so unusual. And in some places, there's no witness at all. Can you imagine that there would be no churches, no witness, no person who knows Jesus? We gotta go. We have to go. But it crosses barriers, all kinds of barriers. Here's the third one. Are we asking great questions? Jesus is so good at this. Like he said, who do people say that I am? He asked more questions than he made statements. Philip doesn't start with a challenge. When he runs up to the chariot, he says, do you understand what you're reading? And the guy says, like, how could I? Nobody can explain it to me. Can you help me? You know? It's like questions are so powerful. It shows interest. Isn't it amazing? We just want to talk all the time. And I'm doing it right now, but they're paying me. No, they're not paying me. I'm just here because I'm home. We learned a simple thing, because sometimes it's hard, right? So um, how many of you have ever been in a situation where you're talking to somebody that you don't know for 20 minutes and you don't know their name yet, and it feels really awkward then to ask their name? Can you, yeah, yeah. How many of you, within about 10 seconds after they say their name, you've already forgotten their name? How many of you have ever forgotten your own name? <laughs> wow, we got a whole section up here. <laughs> Would you guys help them later on in the service? No, so here's a question that you can say. When you meet somebody new, hello, my name is. Hello, my name is. Because most of the time you know your own name. And then focus on hearing their name. Okay? Let me take you through a little, little thing real quick. I want you to imagine a nameplate. You know how people have that on their desk, a nameplate? Okay? On top of that nameplate, I want you to imagine a house. A house on top of that nameplate. On top of that nameplate is a family. Okay, do this with me, okay? First of all, there's a nameplate. Just do it with me. You can do this. Come on, this isn't hard. We're not in children's church. We're in big church. Nameplate. Say it with me. Nameplate. On top of the nameplate is a house. Say it again. A house. On top of the house is a family. And the family's holding a very large clock. And unique to the clock is that the hands are praying hands. Okay? Stand up with me real quick. We're going to do this all together. And if you're not doing it, do it anyway. Okay, this is not hard. First of all, there's a very large nameplate. On top of the nameplate is a house. On top of the house is a family. And the family's holding a very large clock. And the clock has praying hands. Great. Here, let me teach you what this is. The first part, the nameplate, is this. Hi, my name is. It's just that simple. A lot of times we forget to get that going, and it's just simple. And then focus and concentrate get their name then here's the second thing you could say tell me where you live you know what's so powerful about that it's an open-ended question and there's a whole bunch of people that will tell you a lot of different things I've had people say well right now I live such and such but where I really want to live I used to live man I wish I still lived there you know and they they go in and they can say whatever they want to say and the conversation is totally in their control I don't have to say do you live on the east side or the west side or the north side or the south side I, I, it, they can tell me whatever they want to do I've had people tell me about the dream house they have and they just go on and you find out things about them right and then on top of that house is a family and here's the question tell me about your family how many of you have ever been looking at hands to figure out if somebody's married or not married? Am I the only one that ever did that? I did that all of my life. This question is so powerful. Tell me about your family because it puts it in their control. When you say, so are you married? Do you know there's about 173,000 bad answers to that question? <laughs> Well, I'd like to be. Thanks for mentioning that. Uh, I was. I just got a divorce. Uh, my spouse just passed away. Like, like, it just doesn't go where people want to go a lot of times. 
But tell me about your family. I've heard about sisters. I've heard about cousins. I've heard about parents. I've heard about grandparents. I've heard about grandchildren. That's the one you have to be really careful on still because <laughs> they go forever. I have, I have eight grandchildren, and I have to talk about. But, but tell me about your family. It allows them to just, and again, you find out some things. Sometimes they don't talk about some aspects of family, and it's like, oh, that's just interesting. You start noting those things. And then how do you spend your time as the clock? How do you spend your time? If you want to ask me how I love to spend my time, I love to hike. I don't backpack. Why would you carry all that junk with you? I love to hike. I'm leaving this week for Flagstaff. I'm going to go to the, I've never been to the Big Ditch, the Grand Canyon. Uh, and I'm going to hike. My, both, my wife and I both like to hike, and we're going with friends that love to hike. And I can't wait. I love to hike. If you ask me what I, what I do in my spare time, any chance I can. I've been in Yosemite 10 times. I didn't get there this year. Ah, it was, waterfalls were amazing. Anyway, I stopped talking. And then... Here's the question, how can I pray for you? But I added this word to it. How can I best pray for you? How can I best pray for you? I'm telling you, I can't believe the answer to this question is 100% of the time the same for me. And here's the, here's the response when I say, how can I best pray for you? That's a great question. That's what I get every single time. I, I have 250, 300 of those. And then they go far deeper than they've ever probably wanted to. I, I, when I used to just say, how can I pray for you? People say, oh, things are going okay. But they, maybe they mention a cousin that's not doing well. I say, what about your cousin? Oh, yeah, pray for my cousin, you know. But when I say, how can I best, they go very deep and very personal. And there's not a person in this world today that doesn't need prayer. I think it's the most powerful witness we have right now because there are people that are blocking the gospel, don't want to hear about Jesus, but prayer overcomes that. I always pray in Jesus' name. I don't try to pray the prayer of salvation in that prayer. I just pray for their needs. I've had people open up in crazy ways. I just got back from Washington, D.C. The last time I was there, I'm on a board that meets twice a year down there. Um, I had an empty seat next to me. Sometimes that's just a blessing, you know, because because you watch those people that are coming down the aisle that you go, please don't sit by me, please don't sit by me. Plane was super full, and at the last minute, this young guy, this college student, comes and sits down next to me, and they're rushing everything, and he sits down, he has a bag, and I said, I can put it up for you, so I threw it up there, and he didn't put headphones on, I don't have headphones on. His name's Stephen. I said, hi, my name's Dennis. Told me his name was Stephen, we started talking. And uh, I couldn't believe how deep we got with the questions. And uh, he told me that his, his mom was Portuguese his, from Brazil. His dad was a very, very successful builder all internationally. He'd been to 34 countries already in his life. He was 22 years old, and, and all this was going on. I mean, it was just fun. We were sharing a whole bunch of stuff. And I said, hey, uh, how can I pray for you? Dead serious. He said, I just... I don't know, I just feel lost. Like I've thought about taking my life in the last few months because I don't think there's any purpose for me. I've got, I've got everything, but nothing matters. Um, tears come to his eyes and I said, have you ever considered Christianity? He goes, no, we were atheists in our home. Nothing, none of that was allowed. My mom had some background, but my dad had nothing. And he said, but I actually have been studying the Bible a little bit. He said, I started reading it. And I said, how do you read it? He goes, I have this app called YouVersion, the one we all have. I said, where'd you start? He said, Genesis. I go, I don't encourage you to read John, you know. And I prayed with him. Then he tells me this story. He said, I was going back to Chicago to university and when I got to the airport, I realized I didn't have my, my mouth gear that I have to have for my teeth, and I'm actually leaving on a trip to Europe, and I'm going to be gone for four months, and my mom would kill me if I didn't have that with me. Moms, right? So he said, I bolted home, and I called. He said, I was supposed to be on Southwest Airlines. I called American Airlines, got a ticket. I was so thrilled. I got there, and they closed the gate, 
and I couldn't get on the flight. And he said, I ran over to United and they had a seat, they had one seat left, and guess who it's next to? Because I was gonna ask a question, how can I pray for you and share Christ? And wouldn't it be like the Holy Spirit to put him next to somebody who knows God already, knows Christ already, and I wanna tell you, since you already know Christ, he's putting people in your lives already because he's not gonna put him next to an atheist. And he's gonna create a hunger in their lives so that you can give them the bread of life. Are we asking great questions? Are we sharing the word? That's what's so powerful, and that's what happens in this passage. I just, one story here, it's just so powerful. My wife is a pastor. Uh, for three years, we had a church, micro church full of Muslim men so shocking to me still that they would come at all, that they would come and be led by a woman, that they would come, they didn't know who I was, didn't know, and didn't care really who I was, didn't really matter, I was gone quite a bit, and she led these through, just straight on Bible study, just discovery Bibles, where you say, okay, what does this say about God? What does this say about people? What, how can I apply it? Who can I share it with? There's just four questions, and you just study the word, you read the passage, and then people kind of, kind of try to repeat what was in there and stuff. We're in First John chapter two, we'd studied several books already, and we get to First John chapter two, where it says, these things I've written to you that you might not sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ, who not only died for our sins, but he died for the sins of the entire world. And Mirage, the guy in the study, said, what? I've never heard that before. And he knew the scripture pretty good. He said, I thought he only died for Christians. That says he died for the sins of the entire world. Can I say that better than the word can say that? We gotta be sharing scripture with people. Are we sharing the word? And then finally, are we anticipating a point of decision? Philip shares with this Ethiopian eunuch and they happen to come along water in a desert. I love how Holy Spirit works these things out. What keeps me from being baptized? Absolutely nothing. And he baptizes him. Hey, if you're here and you've come to Christ but you've never been baptized, get baptized. What's holding you back? Something happens during baptism that we call a means of grace that God actually seals in your life that this is real for you. I'll never forget. I received Christ on May 20th, 1973, and in September, I was baptized. And something happened that day. And guess what? My mom and my sister-in-law came because somebody needed to show up for the kid for this thing. And within just a few months, they both came to Christ because they heard my testimony and several other testimonies. I gotta believe that that Ethiopian eunuch not only was baptized, but all of his soldiers and, and key guys with him heard the gospel for the first time in their lives too. And you know what? He went back to Africa, Ethiopia, and started churches. No apostle ever went to Africa to share. This guy went, and there are powerful church history of churches starting in Ethiopia because Philip heard God's voice, went to a desert, reached one man, baptized him, and he went back and transformed a country. We talk about sometimes who's the first Gentile convert. It's, it's not Cornelius. It's this Ethiopian eunuch, black man, heads to a whole nation that's opened because one man heard God's voice and said, I'll go to the desert wherever you tell me to go. I'll talk to the people and when I see them, I'll share the good news of Jesus Christ and you can do that too. So, are you listening for the Holy Spirit? Are you willing to cross barriers? Are you asking great questions? Do you share the word? Do you anticipate a point of decision? And I wanna add just one more question. Are you willing to go? I don't care what age you are, I wish there were a whole bunch of kids in here because I think they'd respond. Almost all of our missionaries that are on the field long term accepted a call somewhere between eight and 22 years old. But we got a whole bunch of people right now that are going later. In fact, the leaders that Jared and Emma are working with, they, they were pastors for years and they now go to that country. I, it's unbelievable who they are and what they do and the impact they're having. Some of you may have done a career and you're like, hey, we got everything we need. Maybe that's you. 
Because we could use some people that really understand business. In fact, we have a whole thing called Global Marketplace Multipliers because there's a lot of places we can't send missionaries, but we can send business people. Women, men, doesn't matter. And it's exciting what God's doing through that, opening brand new countries that have been closed to the gospel forever. If I named some of those countries, you'd go, no way. Yes. So if God's speaking to you, Jared and Emma have a table out there, and I'm not going to be in competition with them, but if you want to talk to them, talk to them for sure. They're your missionaries. Thank you for doing that. But I'll be right around that area. I'd love to talk to anybody, and I'd love to help you take a next step because it's a series of steps you don't leave tomorrow. But I believe God's been speaking to people. Would you stand with me, please? Close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to. I know this has been a troubling week in the life of Woodland Church. I got on that plane yesterday and I just said, Holy Spirit, what do you want to have happen? And I just heard him say, just invite me. Because there's nothing he doesn't know and he's not ready for. And so I just said, oh, come Holy Spirit. And we prayed that together today. Because it doesn't really matter what's happening around us. It, it happens to matter a lot what's happening in us. And if God's been speaking to you today, man, you have prayer partners here that are going to be available and pray. If you're one of those prayer partners, you can even come down right now. But some of you uniquely sense you need to take at least a step towards answering a call to missions, going to a very different place than just somewhere around here. Some of you are already five, six, seven steps into that, and you're like, okay, it's time to seal the deal. Like, I've investigated it enough. It's time to talk to somebody who can take me the next steps. And for some of you, God, just ignited your heart in prayer around Jared and Emma today. Man, stop by and say, I'd like to be a prayer partner. That matters more than you can even imagine. Some of you need to go, and we'd love to talk to you. So Holy Spirit, we asked you to come, you came. And I can't imagine how you've been speaking to some of us so individually, so significantly. But I also am very aware that there's an enemy who comes to steal and kill and destroy and loves to rob those thoughts, distract those thoughts, keep us from paying attention, that we would sometimes want to run and hide from some of those calls. Even the day that I was hanging onto that pew saying, I wanted to go forward, I don't want to go forward. There might even be somebody here today that heard that testimony, and they need to come to you for the first time. So Lord, just give them the courage to come and to pray, and then would you do your good work in their lives and their hearts. We're not gonna take much time with this. If you need to come forward for prayer, just come. And uh, I hear a guitar playing, great. Kurt, you wanna pray, close the service. Um, I got this t-shirt and it hasn't changed. Thanks for letting me be here.